In this video, we're going to look at problems dealing with PES, or photoelectron spectroscopy. In these problems, you'll see a spectrum like the one in front of you, and the y-axis will be relative number of electrons, and the x-axis will be ionization energy. And you'll see peaks along the spectrum. However many peaks you have would be how many subshells you have. So if there's three peaks, you would have three subshells. Always look at how your x-axis is arranged. So here it's going from high down to low ionization energy. So if you think about it, it would take more energy to remove inner electrons because they're closer to that positive nucleus and less energy to remove outer electrons. So the reason why this spectrum is usually arranged from high to low is so that this xy intercept here can represent the nucleus and as I go along the x-axis, I'd be getting further from the nucleus. So that first peak would represent the subshell closest to the nucleus, and that last peak would represent the subshell that's furthest from the nucleus. Now, sometimes in some problems, the axis is reversed, so always check the x-axis before starting problems. So these three peaks represent three subshells, okay? Um, the height of the peak represents about the relative number of electrons that are in that particular subshell. So if I look at that first peak, since it's closest to the nucleus, it would represent the 1s electrons, and we know that I could fill a maximum of 2 before moving on. That second peak, which requires a lot less energy to remove those electrons, would be my 2s subshell. And notice it has the same height as the 1s, so I could assume that this is 2s2. And that last peak would represent the 2p electrons. And if I kind of look across here, Okay, this is about three times the height of that 2s peak, so this would be 2p6. So though I can't get the exact number of electrons by just moving across the axis, I can compare the heights of the peaks to each other to figure out the relative numbers of electrons. Take a look at this next example and give it a try. So again, look at your x-axis. It goes from high down to low ionization energy, so the nucleus is closest to the xy-intercept. So these would be my 1s electrons, and there would be two of them. And the second peak is half the height, so this would be 2s1. So this would represent lithium. Take a moment and try this example. So this would, uh, my xy intercept would represent the nucleus because the highest ionization energy is closest to the y-axis. So again, this would be 1s2, this would be 2s2, same height. This is three times the height, so it would be 2p6. And this is half the height of the 2s, so this would be 3s1, and this would represent sodium. Notice that the 1s2 electrons have a much higher ionization energy than the 2s, so a lot of the times there might be a break in the graph. Sometimes the 1s2 might even be intentionally cut out of the picture. Take a moment and try this example if you haven't done so. So if I go across, again, this is high ionization energy, this is low, so this would be my closest to the nucleus, so this is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, this would be 3s2, and this is half, uh, double the height, so this would be 3p4, so this would represent sulfur. And these here would be my valence electrons, they are furthest from the nucleus and easiest to remove. Take a moment and try this example. So this would be 1s2, because again, I'm going from high to low ionization energy, so my nucleus would be closest to the xy intercept. This would be 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and this is the same height, so this would be 3p2. So the E and the C would represent p electrons, so that would be choice C. Take a moment and try this example. Notice here I have two elements superimposed onto each other, and you might see questions ask, asking you about the PES spectra, um, comparing them, and you might have similar ex explanations to if I were asking you why does one element have a higher ionization energy than the other. It's really just a graphical representation of ionization energy. So any questions about ionization energy would be fair game for questions relating to PES. So why are fluorine peaks to the left of boron? So if you notice every single peak, so this is 1s2 of fluorine, this is the 1s2 of boron. Here's the 2s2 of fluorine, here's the um, 2s2 of boron. Each of the peaks are to the left 
um, fluorine is, is to the left of boron. So why is that? Fluorine has a nuclear charge of 9. There's 9 protons in that nucleus, and boron has a nuclear charge of 5. There's only 5 protons in the nucleus. So for each of these subshells, fluorine's nucleus is pulling harder, or each of the subshells, the electrons in the subshells, have a higher effective nuclear charge in fluorine than they do for boron. So that's why all of these fluorine peaks are to the left or require a higher ionization energy than that of boron. Again, your explanation is being tied back to effective nuclear charge or the number of protons, which increase the Coulombic force of attraction um, on the electrons, pulling them in tighter, making it more difficult to remove. For B, why is there one peak in fluorine that is so much taller than all of the others? Because these would represent my 2P5 electrons, and these would be 2P1 of boron because I have more electrons in that particular subshell. So remember, the height or the intensity of the signal is relating to the number of electrons. Just be aware of your axis again, because if um, this axis were reversed, if instead of going from high to low, it went from low to high, then rather than being to the left, the fluorine peaks would be to the right. Take a moment and try this example. This is sulfur again that we've seen before. This is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p4. And that answers A and B. So C, sketch the relative heights of aluminum. So let's think about would aluminum's the, uh, electrons in each subshell, would they have higher or lower ionization energy? Well, it has a lower atomic number, so it has less protons in the nucleus, which would not pull those electrons in as much. So it would have a lower um, force of attraction. So therefore, it would have a lower ionization energy. It would require less energy to remove those electrons. So looking at my axis, if it goes from high down to low, I would want my peaks to somewhere to the right. And I don't care exactly where you place them as long as it makes sense. So here would be like a 1s2 of aluminum. Here would be a 2s2 and a 2p6 of aluminum. And then maybe a 3s2 and a 3p1 of aluminum. And remember that it wouldn't have the exact same height, that last peak, because there'd be less electrons in it. So I want to show that aluminum has a lower ionization energy um, by putting the peaks to the right based on my axis here. And then D says draw a circle around the peak whose energy is equal to the first ionization energy. Um, that would be my last or outer electrons here. So here would be my first ionization energy. Take a moment and try this example. Here's sulfur again, but it's represented in a slightly different way. Um, they kind of broke it up vertically. So if I look at the top, this is 100 to 500, and then 10 to 100, and then 0 to 10. So this is my highest ionization energy. This would be 1s2. And then notice that my, um, my higher ionization energy is further down. So my nucleus is actually further to the right. And as I go to the left, I am working my way out. So this would be 2s2, because it's harder to remove, has a higher ionization energy um, than 2p6. This would be 3s2 and 3p4. Okay. And then the last question, um, tell the relative locations for aluminum, is really the same question as before. But because the, um, the axis is reversed, I would want the peaks, rather than being to the right of it, I would want the peaks somewhere to the left of it for aluminum um, to show that it would be easier to remove aluminum's 1s electron than it would be um, to remove sulfur's because it has a lower effective nuclear charge.